Jeremy, great to get you onto Real Vision. Thank you. Awesome to be here. Um, listen, before we kind of get into the meat of this, I'd love to hear a bit of your journey into crypto. How the hell did you get here? Yeah, it's a it's a great it's a great question. Um, you know, m- my background is is in building kind of internet software platform companies, and you know, sort of started in the early '90s um, and the mid '90s in the sort of first generation of the commercialization of the internet, and was very focused on how to build essentially like the tools and the infrastructure for building the web. Um, and and did that, built a public company, merged into another public company, was CTO there. Um, and then kind of the next kind of generation was really working on basically, um, you know, creating the platforms that were necessary to do television on the internet, sort of like we're doing right now. Um, right. And uh, and built out a, a, another company called Bright Cove. Which uh, we use Bright Cove for Real Vision, actually. Well, th- there you go. So uh, you're, you're a customer of mine. Um, and, uh, you know, built that out, grew that, took that company public. Um, and in 2012, which was actually not long after I took Bright Cove public, um, kind of went down the rabbit hole in crypto. And now the interesting thing for me is that, you know, all of the things that I've worked on in my career, there's like a thread that runs through it all. And the thread is basically what brought me into the internet in the first place back in 1990, 91, was the realization that this was a open network that any computer could connect to. And that basically the the protocol layer of the internet um, was also a set of essentially open protocols, open standards, and that that distributed or decentralized infrastructure was incredibly powerful. It would, and, and back then I was I was like, okay, this is going to disintermediate media. This is going to disintermediate communications. The way that software is distributed, it's all just going to move to to the web. All these kinds of things, and and the same kind of thing with with television. It was like, you know, why are people you know dependent on like birds in the sky or physical plant into a home to distribute television? Like open protocols, decentralized distributed infrastructure on the internet, it's gonna mean everyone can be a television, you know, producer, distributor, et cetera. And so that that's always animated everything that I've been interested in. I also happen to have, you know, studied kind of international political economy, global macro, other things a long time ago. Um, and so I've always had a, a kind of interest in, in kind of the global financial system, uh, comparative economic systems, and after the financial crisis in 2008, I, I kind of went down the rabbit hole of I, I want to more deeply understand central banking. I want to understand, you know, the, the way the, the underlying kind of currency system works. And that was just like at a personal level. I was I wanted to get into that. So in 2012, when I uh, kind of got interested in Bitcoin um, specifically, it like connected all the dots for me. It was like, OK, this is like the next logical infrastructure layer, the Internet. It's another layer. That's mi- it's like a missing layer of the internet, and my interest in sort of like the impact this all of this stuff can have like on global political and economic systems like very profound, and so I just I couldn't help myself basically I just went deeper and deeper and deeper and then in um, and then in 2013 uh, decided to actually s- step out of running a public company and and founded a co-founded uh, circle. Um, and, and so that was kind of the journey there. And, and you know, I think a lot of the ideas um, that, that we've been pursuing since founding the company, um, you know, are starting to really materialize. So what was the vision when you started it? I mean, I actually got into the crypto journey at the same point because I was in Europe at the time. We almost lost the banking system. That was soon after the financial crisis. We saw Cyprus. Sorry for interrupting your video, but I have a very important message to share. At Real Vision, we pride ourselves on providing the very best in-depth expert analysis available to help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy. So if you like what you see on the Real Vision YouTube channel, that's just the tip of the iceberg. You should come to realvision.com and see how we're not leaving any stone unturned from publishing more in-depth videos, live discussions, written reports, and our latest feature, The Exchange, where you get a chance to engage with experts fellow subscribers, and learn from everyone's experience, which can't be wrapped in a video. It's an experience which you live and learn from. So if you go to the link in the description or go to realvision.com, it costs you just $1. I don't think it's something you could afford to be without. So what was the vision when you started it? I mean, I actually got into the crypto journey at the same point because I was in Europe at the time. We almost lost the banking system. 
that was soon after the financial crisis, we saw Cyprus. And I started yeah. looking into, can I create the world's safest bank? And then a friend of mine came to me and said, actually, you need to look at Bitcoin. And that yeah, started me right. on that journey. Um, so when you started Circle, what were you trying to do? So interestingly, what we were trying to do when we started Circle is more or less what we're doing now. Um, and it's it's been an interesting journey to get here. And so like if you go back to like the the earliest like blog posts when we debuted the company and and I, I you know it's funny I look back at like the the first like investor materials we created back in in the spring of 2013 our belief was that it would become possible to essentially take what we think of as as traditional money i.e. like the liabilities of a central bank and represent that as digital currency and transact it on public you know, public blockchains as we call them now, but transacted as, as almost like a new protocol layer for how you know fiat could be stored and exchanged and transacted. And um, you know, we envisioned a kind of hybrid uh, fiat crypto model that could make that possible. And the belief was that that would become possible, and that um, issuing other types of assets on top of this infrastructure would become possible. That you'd be you'd have programmability of those assets. So essentially the idea that like a dollar or a euro would be like a native data type on the internet, just like an MP3 or a text file or a JPEG, and that it would become programmable. And, and so back in early 2013, a lot of people in the, in the Bitcoin community were really excited about the idea of smart contracts. It brought a lot of people in. It was like, whoa, if this is like a uh, a new global compute engine that's like trustworthy and tamper proof and you can deploy code to it. And then you have like these underlying financial assets that you can interact with. That's like super profound. And, and like you can imagine actually recreating a lot of what we think of as the financial system on top of that. So that's what kind of drew us in. And, and the first product we created, actually, it was a, a consumer facing product um, that essentially took dollars, euros, pounds, and allowed them to seamlessly transact over the Bitcoin network. And so we use Bitcoin as like, essentially like a, a, an open settlement layer. Yep. And, but the user never knew it. It was like, I have a dollar and I'm gonna beam it to, to a, what is essentially a Bitcoin wallet. We managed all the underlying treasury liquidity and stuff to make that work. Um, but it turned out like doing that on top of Bitcoin was, I don't want to say it was the wrong idea, but basically, you know, Bitcoin preserved its position as like a digital gold. And, you know, there was not an impetus in the Bitcoin community to focus on, you know, transaction throughput, scaling uh, on, on, you know, kind of being a, a payment system, basically. And, 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 and there was very little interest in expanding it in terms of its programmability with things like smart contracts. And so, you know, a lot of things that we had wanted to do just didn't, this weren't possible. And Bitcoin at, at, in late 2016 was quite expensive and still relatively expensive to transact with. And so we basically um, in 2017 sort of said, okay, Ethereum's here. It's kind of production beta. It's kind of in a good place that you could actually build like a, a you know, what we now call stable coins, but you could build essentially like a fiat protocol layer on top of it. And so we envisioned that, and we and and that led to the creation of USDC, and uh, and which we then launched in 2018, and and that's grown a lot. So now today, like there's essentially like these new standards for fiat digital currency that are kind of private sector led, i.e., these sort of regulated stablecoin models. USDC is by far the biggest in terms of you know playing in in that you know regulated space, and. Um, and now it's becoming possible to basically, you know, transact um, instantly, globally, extremely inexpensively. And the ideas of programmable money have arrived as well. I mean, DeFi is programmable money. It's people basically saying, how do I, you know, how do I, you know, write financial markets in code, deploy it on the Internet? And then, you know, stablecoins become a really critical part of that as well. So we're, we're sort of seeing a lot of the early things that we envision becoming possible starting to happen. So who are the main users currently of um, USDC? I mean, USDC, um, when we launched it with Coinbase, so Coinbase joined a consortium with us, Center Consortium, which governs sort of USDC. And that, that's actually going to be expanding a lot um, in, the, in the coming uh, year or two. But um, 
you know, the, the bootstrap use case, as I like to call it, was, you know, crypto capital markets, basically. So, um, you know, in, in late 2018 or, or mid, mid to late 2018, you know, people wanted a transparent, audited, compliant, liquid, redeemable dollar stablecoin. Um, I, I not tether. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, people wanted that. So like the, 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 the bootstrap use case was, okay, this is going to be a, a better, you know, a better way to do this. And, you know, it's not, uh, it's not the Roach Motel. It's, you know, it, you know, you, you can get in and out of it. And, you know, Circle offered a really, really straightforward institutional service for getting, for utilizing it. And Coinbase obviously offered a really compelling retail way to get in and out of it. And it was always, you know, it just worked. It was always, it was free to create it, free to redeem it. And, and so it, it sort of grew in that use case. Um, and, and through, you know, if you look at like late 2018 into like late 2019, you know, obviously like the crypto markets weren't as, as robust as they are, you know, right now, but you know, things, things were adoption of stable coins was growing. And so it be, it just got listed on tons of exchanges. Every wallet decided to support it. Custodians started supporting it. So the whole ecosystem, you know, really adopted it. And we did, I think, a really good job of that. Hundreds of companies started just saying, "Okay, we're adding support for this," and um, and and that sort of ties into the next piece, which is, you know, we very early on focused on part, you know working with developer teams that were building what is now DeFi, right? And the DeFi movement in in late 2018 was really nascent. And, um, but by summer of 2019, like stuff was getting deployed, like, you know, Compound was out there, you know, the, uh, you know, a number of other things were out there. And, and so, you know, first was just like as a, as essentially a dollar market infrastructure for crypto capital markets, like just being, being a great dollar market infrastructure. And then secondly, you know, was, okay, now this is actually uh, the, what people want to borrow and lend and utilize um, in, in DeFi markets. And then obviously in 2020, you know, DeFi has exploded. USDC has been a huge component of, of that. Um, and, um, and obviously crypto capital markets have exploded and, and it's grown a lot in there. But what was fascinating was we were seeing, you know, interest in, hey, you know, this is actually like, once people started utilizing it, um, people realize like, wow, I have a digital dollar that I can transact on the internet. I can transact with anyone with no counterparty risk at the, you know, basically with the fi final settlement in seconds for a, a fraction of the cost of what we think of as, as traditional international money movement. And, you know, people were waking up like this is actually a really good payments and settlement medium. And so that's been one of the big stories for us in 2020 is tons of different types of businesses that are now saying this is a better way to store value, transmit value, et cetera. And, um, you know, one of the big themes, for example, is we've seen um, these incredible interest in demand from Latin America, from Africa, from Southeast Asia, where it's a dollarization might be the theme if you want to think of it that way. But, you know, these sort of digital currency dollars are, are really attractive um, as well, both as a store of value uh, relative to say what their current currencies are doing. Um, you know, we think of Bitcoin as the as the main store of value kind of scenario for for crypto, and it, it obviously is is the biggest. Um, but dollars are also a pretty interesting store of value in a lot of cases too. Yeah, and nobody can get enough dollars. I mean, you know, we've, we've got problems alone. I mean, I've talked about this. I don't know if you're how familiar you are with the euro dollar market. Of course, yeah, very. And this is a new euro dollar essentially yeah. because you can, right. it can be created outside the dollar banking system and distributed globally. Right. And right now, most of the European banks don't really lend out their dollars, and yeah. the Japanese banks. So that's yeah. well, the staff of dollars, and this right, is right. And euro dollars obviously played a really critical role, and have historically played a really critical role in capital markets activity uh, and, and hedging. But like, I think stable coins are going to be are going to you know euro dollars never moved into transactional currencies, right? They didn't really move into the hands of users that are transacting with them, no. but, but stable coins are right. You got a smartphone. You got an app. Peer to peer. Boom! You're up and running. And um, you know, well, you you get rid of the banking sector out of the middle, right? Which is where the velocity of money dies. Right, 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 right. Yeah, no, I mean, so it, it, it's it's um, so that that's been part of the story. And I, I think for us, like going into this year, I mean, USDC grew 
um, enormously last year. It grew 800% um, year on year. We started the year with like 450 million ish in circulation. We, we ended the year literally right around midnight on the 31st at 4 billion USDC in circulation. It's we've already we've already seen almost 900 million issued in the first two weeks of January, <laughs> um, and, and so uh, you know it's it, it's it's really interesting. And um, the technology is getting to a place where. Uh, with like what I call kind of like third generation blockchain infrastructure, where you're able to transact USDC on blockchains at, you know, half, you know, half a second, like 500 milliseconds or less with settlement finality at a fraction of a cent uh, to, to transact those. And with, you know, you know, some of these third generation blockchains have capacity to support tens of thousands of transactions per second. You start to say, "Wow, okay, you could actually move like fulsome capital markets over to this, and you know, fulsome retail scale payment activity as well." And so, I think that's one of the things that we're really looking for as we go forward is this getting integrated into into more uh, you know sectors of financial activity. And what's happening is DeFi is giving it a yield curve. So you know, exactly. much like much like the euro dollar market, okay, euro dollar market goes further out, but you're starting to get still very nascent. Totally. So you can't get the price of money, internet money, essentially. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we're, we're very, very, we, we're, you know, paying a lot of attention to that. We actually have a, a high yield digital dollar account product that's launching uh, this quarter, actually. It's institutional. It's, it's for businesses. So if you're a business and you've got cash, you can convert your cash to USDC and put it into um, yield markets. And, you know, we're, we're giving, you know, basically... Eight and a half percent for an open term product, and you know upwards of around eleven percent for tenor based you know uh, products, and that's you know basically putting you know dollars into stablecoin into these interest rate markets, and you know that's from a corporate treasury perspective really attractive, right? If I'm a if I'm a corporation and I'm sitting on working capital, like what I you know how, how much of that am I willing to you know allocate to essentially these new these new risk markets and. And what is the what is the counterparty risk? Because the euro dollar market is obviously a, a bunch of participants, so it's it's a relatively spread. How, how does it work in this? The way this product is um, is being rolled out is it's through a strategic partnership that we put together with Genesis, and um, you know Genesis within Digital Currency Group. Genesis is is obviously one of the biggest crypto primes out there, and Genesis Capital is the largest institutional. Uh, you know, lending uh, uh, provider, uh, you know, in, in, in the world right now in the crypto lending space. And so what, what you're really doing is you're basically saying there is a high quality, uh, you know, you know, uh, underwritten institutional borrowing, you know, base that's out there that are active market participants in digital asset markets, and you're effectively lending to them. Um, and and you know these firms and their I mean their their counterparties are are uh, you know many many of the top institutional players in the market. Um, you know the you know the, the cost of capital may seem high when you say oh wow okay it's a ten percent cost of capital, but you know the market participants are making significantly more than that. And so when you, you you're what you're really doing it's almost like pass it's a passive way to participate in the digital asset markets. It's a you know an interest bearing passive way to participate in these markets without buying the underlying Bitcoin. Um, so it's an interesting you know it's an interesting um, you know space that's emerged around that. I mean that's effectively what DeFi yield is too, um, uh, but you're you're dealing with more retail participants in that case. And can institutions actually put this on their books yet? Or are they starting to use firms like Luca to try and get it kind of shoehorned in? Because it's not easy, even though to you and I, stablecoin is pretty straightforward, but to an institution, it's not. So the good news here is that, um, you know, there are more and more public companies with stablecoins on their books. <laughs> and so, you know, the you know, big accounting firms are now you know, dealing with that. Uh, there, there are, you know, there's more and more clarity around how to treat um, these as a, as, a, as a financial asset. I mean, obviously, even the the you know the guidance that came out just last week from the OCC, basically defining these you know USDC like or dollar stablecoins as electronic stored value, and that's very very important um, as a classification. Uh, and so all these things are making are, are part of progress towards 
it's the acceptance, not just from a record keeping perspective, but acceptance with as a settlement medium as well. So let's talk a bit about that OCCC guidance. Um, what, what's your take on it? I think it's I think it's a, a major watershed event, um, and you know I, I think th- there there are a few pieces to it. I think the first is you know it, it follows on the heels of the uh, presidential working group um, uh, sort of policy recommendations on dollar stablecoins in the United States, which came out just before the holidays, and that really had to do with saying kind of um, arrangements that are, are are created for the issuance and operation of dollar stablecoins need to meet a set of expectations. Um, that that presidential working group kind of, you know, uh, those recommendations that came out very closely mapped to how center consortium operates. So that that was good just in terms of the the what I think about is the 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 governance, the risk management, the compliance, other things that go beyond this. The OCC guidance um, is getting kind of like very specific. It's saying, okay, if you are a bank uh, in the United States financial system, you can uh, utilize stable coins as a payment infrastructure. You can issue them yourself uh, as well. So you can participate in issuance, uh, but, but you can utilize it as a payment infrastructure on par with ACH on par with SWIFT, uh, on par with debit network rails. And it defines how to classify and think about it as like an electronic stored value medium. Um, and it specifically provides a whole set of guidance on using public using this on public blockchains. And so it, it is elevating public blockchains like the Bitcoin network, the Ethereum network, and other uh, public blockchain networks to being market infrastructure for the mainstream financial system in the United States, which is a huge deal. And this is like, you know, I think this is um, this is significant and it ladders on the SEC guidance that came out in late December as well, which basically after three years, the SEC finally clarified that broker dealers can self custody clear and settle digital assets uh, you know, you know, you know, you, you, uh, around kind of custody rules and transfer rules and so on. But it clarified that how how you know broker dealers can do that, and that also includes settling essentially these digital assets as securities transactions on public blockchains. And so we now essentially have the SEC and the OCC saying public blockchains are effectively a settlement infrastructure for securities and cash like instruments in the United States. Um, that's a big deal. Um, that's a really big deal. Um, and I, I obviously like the markets responded a lot to that um, because I think, you know, banks can now lean into this, right? So banks can lean into whether it be crypto brokerage or, you know, I want to custody Bitcoin or- Yeah, prime broking, all of that's coming. Absolutely. And, and you know, and I think it also means like things like USDC can be utilized now as a payment and settlement infrastructure for for just straight up payments um, and, uh, and also as a payments and settlement infrastructure tied to other securities as well, which is, I think, really where stuff starts to get a lot more interesting. You know, I'm, I'm getting confused where the, the regular money center banks are going to fit into any of this equation. <laughs> I can understand the investment bank because they'll always find ways of making money. They'll be priming this stuff. They'll be making markets. They'll be involved. Yeah. But, you know, the average bank, I mean, it looks like the writing is on the wall super fast for them now. I mean, DeFi being part of it. Yeah, I mean, DeFi is part of it. I just, I just, uh, I, I do a podcast as well. I did one earlier today with um, Robert Leshner, the you know uh, co-founder and and CEO of Compound Finance, and um, it was it was interesting. I, I titled it DeFi and Self Driving Banks, and um, and the, the the idea was actually from Brian Brooks, who just just uh, left the SEC, and he wrote this editorial for the Financial Times earlier this week. That's right. I saw that. Yeah. The advent of self driving banks. And people, it's sort of like, you know, a machine governs an interest rate market, right? It's totally transparent. It's totally on the internet. Market participants can see the risk management, the collateral management, the, all, all the rules, how it works. But it just runs itself. It runs itself. And that's 
profound. <laughs> you know, it's really, really profound. And that's one building block, which is sort of collateralized, you know, kind of lending and borrowing, right? Um, but the, I think this is, this is sort of, there's this inevitable march forward where more and more functions of what we think of as banking can become autonomous machine mediated uh, kind of things on the internet. And I think likewise, you know, things like stable coins, um, our view, and this has been, you asked a question earlier about what was the kind of concept when we started the company. The, the belief was that once you had kind of like a fiat digital currency model that could work on, on the public internet, on these open networks, that effectively it would drive the, the, the cost of moving value to zero. Just like, you know, the cost of, of sharing a piece of text is zero or the cost of, of having a peer-to-peer -peer video communication is zero. Like the internet and these this distributed architectures and open protocols drives the cost to zero. So the, that was the belief is that when you got to a model, an internet-like model for money, it would drive the cost to zero. And so when you think about money center banks or you think about you know, the, the entire um, stack of firms that are making money from extracting tolls in, in payments, right? There's a vast amount. It's actually trillions of dollars of value. Um, and, you know, I, I, you know, you got to pick your time frame, right? Because it's very easy to like believe your hype and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, uh, but I think, you know, it was like when I started Bright Cove in, in 2004, I was like, television's going to move to the internet. You know, you're, you're not going to have cable. You're, you know, there's going to be a, a, an infinite number of, of, of video channels. You know, every company in the world is going to be doing this. And you're going to be able to do it to any device, right? And back in 2004, like broadband was barely out the gate. Like the technology was was really nascent and people could say, yeah, 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 whatever. Like I, I went and met with, um, you know, CEOs of Comcast and, you know, other big firms and was saying, this is what I think is going to happen. And it's kind of like, ha, ha, you know, but um, but here we are, right? It, 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 these things take like 10 years, but 10 years isn't that long. We're just talking about 2013 and it seems like yesterday. And, and the pace of this is really fast. So I think that's the interesting thing is like, we'll, we'll see this kind of intense commoditization happen over like a five year, 10 year period where the, the, the margin that exists uh, in, in what we think of as kind of payment and settlement will, will, will come in dramatically. Where does your, what happens to your margin then? Where, does, where do you make money in that process if margins are all going to zero? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there, there's a, there's a few things. I mean, I think, you know, you know, first is, um, you know, we're, um, uh, we believe a, a few things. So one is like the, what we think of as treasury infrastructure, um, which is like the core infrastructure, whether a, 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 co a company or a financial institution, like treasury infrastructure is going to become entirely natively digital currency and blockchain based. And um, that's what we build. We build essentially like treasury infrastructure for the internet. And we offer that as a subscription. You know, uh, a company can, can come on, they can, get, they can pay a subscription and they get access to this new kind of banking and treasury infrastructure. And um, we think every company in the world is going to want to do that. And you can, you can automate treasury then easily. Absolutely. Yes, yes. And so... You know, that that then leads into other things like which is, you know, how how can we help businesses utilize their working capital better, um, participate in these different you know types of new markets that are going to exist that are built up on this infrastructure and make that a really seamless process for companies. And so over, you know, th that alone is sort of this what we think of as platform banking, right? The platform banking business model is sort of what we're going after, but very, you know, where digital currency and blockchains are at the center of it, uh, as opposed to the legacy financial system. And I think that leads to the other piece, which is over the long run, we believe that more and more things that what that that we think of as what corporations do, their treasury, uh, you know their governance, the, you know, equity itself as an instrument, uh, you know, debt contracts, so many of the things that go on will move to be digital assets on blockchains in this sure. infrastructure. And, you know, we want to be helping play a role in that transformation. And we think that, you know, 
there, there'll be lots of interesting ways to monetize that. Yeah, I'm, I'm even interested, you know, I've been thinking through, will corporations exist as we understand them? Because corpor corporations created one legal entity. Exactly. But really something like Exxon should be, you know, you should be able to buy a token in their upstream revenue, the downstream Absolutely. green, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Should, so I don't know if corporations are going to exist per se. Yeah. This is a, I, I think this is something I've been thinking a lot about and then that what what is you know a corporate form? What are these new corporate forms? I mean, uh, Robert from Compound, like Comp Token, is a community-owned protocol that generates cash flows that has voting and governance for its development and evolution. Like, wh what is that? Like, is that that's not a corporation, but it's like this on-chain thing, um, and you know. There's ultimately has to be interaction with the, the 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 corporate legal system in different ways, and so I think one of the things that will be interesting is with jurisdictions kind of figuring out some of that. But I I, I totally agree. I think that the nature of corporations changes. This you know this technology shift is, in my opinion, a, a you know it's sort of like the Gutenberg press or the invention of the joint stock corporation, the birth of capital markets, all these kinds of things. It's that big. And you know these things play out over decades, right? But I think you're going to see just more and more experimentation in these what I call new corporate forms, whatever we end up calling them, um, which do involve this these layers of tokenization, um, transparency, governance, access to the revenue streams in different ways. At a macro level, I love it because it gives us more opportunities to seek value and to invest in different things. Yes, because you're going to create tokens that you know talk about. On IP, you know, music streaming rights, Absolutely. celebrities, on influencers, on different parts of what we understand now as corporations. Yes, Just millions of tokens. Totally, absolutely. I, 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 I believe it so much. I mean, I use the, um, you know, the, the, the internet is is good at a lot of different things. One of the things it's really good at is is supporting the development of long tail markets. And w when you think about you know, eBay, when it first came out, right, no one could have ever conceptualized that people would have, you know, individuals with things they want to sell, could act, that there be a marketplace that could actually support that, you know, Beanie Babies or whatever it is, that the long tail of things. No one ever thought that you could basically take, you could monetize um, people's intention and attention with, you know, long tail advertising, right? I'm a tennis instructor in Tallahassee and I can find my customers uh, in an efficient way with, a, with a, a marketplace, an auction marketplace that exists. And the same thing as you go down the list in terms of content um, and, and, you know, obviously like the mega scale marketplaces are Amazon and Alibaba. And there are not, you know, I think people haven't yet realized that we're gonna have long tail capital markets. And, you know, people, you know, the Russell 2000 or NASDAQ, or whatever, like these are going to look tiny in comparison to the capital markets that are being created right now. And this to tokenization theme, right, will fit into that. Like people, you know, there will be, it, it will be viable to efficiently have capital markets at that very, very long tail. And what's interesting is once you tokenize everything, we move away from bonds, credit, stocks, commodities, you go into something which is all called a token, let's say. Yeah. But they all have different attributes. So what you've got is a hyper complex world, which means the other side is you can generate alpha again. Yeah. There's no, yeah. There's no yeah. alpha right now. Yeah. Yeah. Once you do this, this is a really complicated world. And you're seeing yeah. already some asset managers in yeah. the space kind of value picking tokens that everyone's abandoned. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like and they're making enormous returns. There's no yeah, alpha. Absolutely. The yeah. It's it's so nascent. I mean, I think like the De DeFi, um, you know, kind of um, liquidity pools on all these different tokens with AMMs are a really interesting world where you you have people saying, hey, you know, there's a market for, you know, this niche token against ETH or against what, whatever it is. And there are people who are willing to stand in that, be liquidity providers and, and realize significant returns. And so, you know, it's sort of like, it is this kind of creation of, uh, of, of available markets. And a lot of people used to say, well, you know, you know, private company, you know, private company stock is, is, is illiquid. You know, there's a reason why these companies don't go public and, and so on, but in a world where, 
you have, you know, kind of long tail markets with this kind of um, incentivized infrastructure, you can imagine, you know, markets existing for, for things that would at face value appear to be extre extremely thinly traded. You can also composite them into sets and composite them into, you know, uh, essentially, you know, bundles and people can, can, I mean, that's kind of, you know, sort of the, as, you know, layering of these things. Um, but that can be, that can also lead to, to very uh, efficient outcomes as well. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's just a really interesting world to see where that's all going. The other thing that I want to pick your brains about is the central bank digital currencies, because that's the next big elephant that's coming. It's been, so, I mean, the ECB have probably been the clearest of all about what they're trying to do. Um, and Benoit Curé, you know, now he's at the BIS, has made it clear that they're, some people are going to choose programmable forms of money. Others are going to choose a state central bank, you know, stable coin for want of a better word. Yeah. How do you think this plays out? Because it's going to change everything. I keep explaining to people this is going to change everything from fiscal policy to monetary policy to yeah. behavioral economics and yeah. everything. Yeah. What do you what do you think about this? Yeah, you know, I mean, I got a lot of thoughts on this. I think um, the 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 first is I would never bet against the open internet, um, and what I mean by that is that um, you know the 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 velocity of technical innovation on public internet infrastructure and blockchains are an example of that on public internet infrastructure. And the, 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 the kind of innovation curve that's happening with digital currency in that environment, when you think about where it could be two years from now, five years from now, like it, it is, it, it is going to rapidly, rapidly bypass what any government could ever do. Um, it already is. And the, to me, the notion that large or small national governments are going to stand up an infrastructure maintain an infrastructure and evolve an infrastructure for digital currency that uh, that can keep up with what's happening with the public internet and with private sector activity in the public internet. I just don't buy it. Um, it would be like saying, you know, the government sh sh should, uh, should have built, um, you know, all of the communications infrastructure of the internet that we use today, that the government should have built, um, you know, email, it should be a government administered email system, like, it's just not viable. And so I think the internet, you know, you know, the famous, famously Mark Andreessen said sort of software eats the world, I think sort of software and the public internet eats the world. And so I think and that is what blockchains and, and stable coins and other things are, are really layering on. And so in in that world, I just don't believe that you're going to see uh, you know, the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury, just as just talking about the United States right now, it just does not seem tenable to me that they're going to like stand up and operate this infrastructure. But would they just have a stable coin and use your infrastructure, for example? Well, so this this gets into, you know, ultimately, you've got a, you've got, you know, a few things you've got kind of sort of standards and and public infrastructure. You've got financial intermediaries private sector financial intermediaries. And then you've got like risk management supervisory mandates and monetary policy down, down, down there as well, right? And so you kind of go across those things and you say, okay, what is likely to be what achieves scale? And, and so my view is just look at the history of electronic money. The history of electronic money is not a bunch of governments building shit. The history of electronic money is consortium of private financial institution actors getting together to develop standards for interoperability amongst their ledgers, if you will. Um, that's what SWIFT is. Uh, when we think about, you know, in general, like what we think of as the most widely adopted sort of electronic money, it's it's cards, right? It's, it's credit cards, debit cards, et cetera. What are card networks? Card networks are consortiums of members that define a set of technical standards and interoperability and governance around this. And it's not like, you know, when, when, when card infrastructure emerged that the Fed said, wait a minute, no, 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 no. Yeah, because we do cash uh, or, or, or whatnot, like we need to go build that. We need to go build all that infrastructure. Not at all. You know, I think what happens is 
regulators say, okay, if if the if the if the private market establishes sound standards, we want to we want to maybe oversee some of those as sort of systemically important market utilities or systemically important payment systems or other things. And what they'll care about is underneath. Okay, what is the underlying? Um, you know, is this is this M one? What is this? And and what what are the supervisory standards that need to be around it and risk management that need to be around it? And so it, it may be that over in the future, you know, as as center consortium grows, as USDC grows, as more banks and others get involved, and more people are issuing this, that the Fed says, okay. This is this is fine as a as a dollar digital currency standard, but you gotta you know this has to be kept at the Fed or it has to it has to sit inside of these sort of supervisory frameworks. I think that's what happens. Um, I think and then and then like the pace of technical innovation is is going at the speed of the internet. It's not going at the speed of you know software engineers or IBM people that the government hired or whatever you want to think of it. So in other words, there is no Fed coin. Yeah. It's the private sector because it does the same right. thing. It's like the right. euro dollar market. That's right. you know, it's not, it's not yeah. driven by the Fed. Yeah, that's right. It's by liquidity to it and regulate yeah. it where it can. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, just to give you a little bit of insight in this. So we started Center Consortium with Circle and Coinbase. It's now going to grow into a, a, a much broader consortium. We um, David Puth just came in to, to run Center Consortium. David spent his career running capital markets for for State Street and then 19 years at JPM running currencies, capital markets, you know, huge amounts of infrastructure. And then he went to be the CEO of CLS International Bank. It's the largest bank in the world that no one knows. And CLS is a consortium. It's a consortium of 70 of the most critical financial institutions in the world that represent the biggest currencies in the world. And it provides the clearing and settlement infrastructure for those institutions in for major fiat currencies. And it clears $2 trillion a day. And so when we think of like dollars and euros and you know, all these things, like th this, is a, this is a private sector consortium infrastructure that is supervised by like 23 of the, of the most significant central banks. So he ran that for six years. He's now running Center Consortium. This is gonna grow. And I think public blockchain infrastructure combined with arrangements like what Center is doing can become, you know, deemed as like systemically important infrastructure and 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 will work with regulators on this over time. So I, I think that's I'm speaking, you know, somewhat selfishly in that like I, I have a view to this that that we're involved in as a principle, but I also really genuinely believe it. And I think the thing that um the most exciting thing about all of this, it gets back to the comment you made, which is like programmable, programmable assets, right? Um, if, if we just are looking at this as like, what is digital cash or, or, or you know, what is the payment system? It's that, that misses the whole point of all of this, right? The whole point of all of this is that you've got tokenization and you have smart contracts and you have the ability to intermediate an enormous amount of interesting commerce and economic activity through this, this public compute infrastructure. And that's like changed the world stuff and it, it changed the nature of corporations and changed the nature of economic activity. And like, we want to, we want to see that stuff emerge. And the real question is, is like, does, the, how quickly does this become something that's like 10 X better is sort of the, the kind of benchmark that people talk about, like a technology needs to be 10 X better. And then society just says, this is what I want. But how do you solve the central banks problem? Because from what I understand it, listening to many of the central banks, the IMF and BIS as well, they want programmable money to say, you need a different interest rate to me. I want to stimulate you. I want to do, you know, that kind of behavioral incentives that can be tied once you've got this. If it's all a private sector, yeah. how does the Fed or any central bank do that? How do they get what they need out of the system? They can merge monetary and fiscal, which is really what's happening. I, I mean, this gets, this gets into deeper, you know, deeper, you know, like, for example, um, if, if uh, if digital currency units can be M1, and commercial banks can custody this, and you know can can operate with it, um, and you know the Fed decides they're going to go buy treasury bonds, or they're going to go you know uh, effectively inject money, and the 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 you know commercial bank participants in the scheme can issue new USDC or whatever it is. Um, you know, on that, like it, it can it can work with the existing fiscal monetary policy. 
Yeah, but that that doesn't work already, right? Because it, you know, we've seen velocity of money collapses. It's you know, the banks, the banks are yeah. they're all impaired in certain yeah. ways, whether it's yeah. regulatory yeah. impairment or sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I like we're we're gonna go deep on uh, on bigger ideas here, but like I um, I think one of the compelling things about crypto. Um, one of the things that drew me into it, this gets to my armchair uh, political economy uh, stuff, which is the, the concept of full reserve banking and the concept of, you know, you know uh, uh, a, a governments from a fiscal perspective that are bound by full reserve banking systems um, and is, is also a very interesting idea. And, you know, if you go back to the Great Depression and the Chicago Plan, the Chicago Plan, which was very much informed by economists who uh, you know are in the von Mises tradition and and who who look at sound money principles and you know what what are the fundamental risks that exist with uh, the the way that that money works in commercial banking would argue for that if you have the discipline of full reserve money. Um, that it, it will, it's it sort of in, in a sense, it enforces, uh, uh, you know, safer fiscal policy. Um, yeah, although my fear is, you know, humans being humans, they'll just recreate the derivative market all over again. Yeah. I mean, humans will take leverage wherever they can get it in any way, shape or form. And if right. it doesn't exist at the bank level, it'll exist yeah. at the next layer. I mean, the, the derivative market's a quadrillion dollars. <laughs> Yeah, I, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, I mean, look, um, I, I, I think that's right. Um, you know, humans I, are pretty flawed. <laughs> yeah, I guess you know, stepping back from all that, just and coming back to the basics of of if you have what we think of as fiat digital currency units, um, I think that you know the what is effectively like the the underlying capabilities of a sovereign with respect to that, like we're going to see different approaches to that. Um, for sure, and and at the at the kind of protocol level, the technical standards level, the the way all this stuff works, like that piece, which is the innovation of like the the the, the transactability, the 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 efficiency, uh, and and the programmability, like in some ways those are decoupled. I realize there's some there's some interplay there, but to some degree, some of those can be decoupled. And what do you think Europe's going to do with this? Are they just going to issue a digital currency and then let everyone use the existing rails? So, you know, how, how are they thinking about it? I mean, I, I know they, they prefer to have more control over the system. Um, what do you think? You know, I... I, I um, they want a fintech layer. They've said they want fintech. Yeah, and I, I, I think this is one where the market is just going to move way faster than the European Central Bank. Uh, and the, and the, and that's the, not unusual. Yeah. I mean, so I, I just, I think th this is sort of a general belief that I have, which is that the velocity on this is really, really fast. Uh, the, the benefits are gonna start to compound really, really fast. And market participants, whether they be businesses or, or individual consumers or, or financial market participants, um, will, will start seeing those. And, and what, I, again, I, it's a little bit like a, what I said about, say, what might happen in, in the US. I think that that will emerge, and then and then the European you know central bank will kind of have to respond to that and say, okay, all right, this is a reality. We're going to make sure we, we it's safe and sound, and we can supervise it. Versus what they're saying right now, which is, no, 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 we're going to build this, we're going to launch this. I mean, just the interview earlier this week with with Madame Lagarde was in five years. Okay, so five years. What's going to happen in five years in this space? I mean, come on. Right. So, I mean, what is that? Is that a, a bunch of uh, uh, a bunch of engineers working for the European Central Bank that are going to build this in five years? Like, what is that? So I, I think. Um, Very good point. I, I think that the market moves way faster and and then th they'll, they'll have to really react to that. And that's OK. I mean, that, that's OK. So how do you think? I mean, uh, Christine Lagarde talks a lot about Bitcoin. How do you think, I see regulation as an acceptance. If they're building a digital layer, they're regulating people like yourselves, it kind of is, it's acceptance that, okay, there's this collateral, there's this collateral reserve layer and that's right. fine. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I mean, let's go, let's talk about Bitcoin because, I, you know, my, my own long-term view is that, um, is, is really a couple things. I think one is that, um, the, the adoption of, of 
you know, com- commodity money, digital commodity money that includes Bitcoin. I include Ether in that. And there will be other commodity digital monies, Zcash, whatever you want to you know, put there. But that, 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 that is super attractive, non-sovereign uh, with, its, with its inherent digital properties that there will continue to be enormous demand. And that's going to grow and grow and grow. I think governments and central banks are going to put it on the balance sheet. I think governments are going to subsidize its its creation, i.e., like infrastructure for validation, mining. Like that is where we're headed, and that's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And you know, I am am, am now very much a believer in ultimate reserve currency status in in some of this. So I, I think that's that's very real. At the same time. You know, it's not like governments are going to give up on their sovereign currencies, although I think many governments around the world will. Well, yeah. I think what, what is happening is, I mean, globalization itself was part of this. And you, you sort of you look at like trade settlement currencies and sort of how that accounts for how much economic activity and all this sort of stuff like digitization and the Internet and what is what we think of now as like public blockchains. That is going to accelerate that very, very fast. And it's going to lead to some complex decisions amongst government actors as to, okay, you know, wh- what are we using here? And um, I think there will be, I mean, look, I, I, maybe I'm too much of a globalist and an optimist, but I, I actually believe that there will be attempts to create synthetic global digital currencies that, um, that, are, that are based on a, a basket uh, of constantly rebalanced uh, reserve currencies. And I ultimately believe Bitcoin is part of that basket. I, I have exactly the same view. I also think within it, to be a member of that, they'll restrict your money supply. So yeah. You can be in it with 2% money supply growth. Right. right. But it kind of looks like a pseudo totally. odd currency. To- totally. Totally. And then the, the ratio of the, the fiat ba- basket to Bitcoin will evolve just like we had a gold dollar peg, right? So, you know, because my, my view on this is simply if you're a Brazilian, a Brazilian company making commodities, selling them to China, yeah. but your economy and your whole business goes up and down according to the dollar is nonsense. Totally. The, the US is 25% of, of world GDP and 80% of all world trade. Right. So that's untenable. So totally untenable. we can create commodity basket currencies yes. also which exactly. are much more stable in nature yes exactly so we're totally on the same page yeah i think that's exactly coming okay i want to pick your brains about two contentious things now <laughs> um one is how does this tether thing play out yeah i mean um i think like because people are very nervous about it yeah and yeah nobody I mean, knows. There, there's there's a lot of different pieces here right so you, you, you know, um, as, as everyone knows, right, what, what a lot of people consider to be like the bugs, as it were, are actually its features. Um, so the fact that it's opaque, offshore, unregulated, you know, sort of outside the reach of, of U.S. banking regulators at face value, at least, uh, and, uh, and, and it is like this dollar shadow banking system, you know, a lot of Asian money likes that. Right. Which is needed for the world. You know, there are people right. who want to so get money. I, I mean, like that in and of itself, like there is a market need, right? And so it's filling that market need. It's also filling a, a very explicit market need. It just happens to have like the order book liquidity depth in Bitcoin markets in Asia. Like it's just, it, 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 it is in that place because it was in that place. And it sort of has, has, you know, USDC has eaten a lot of share. So USDC as a share has really grown and will continue to grow because, you know, a mainstream financial system for everything from payments and settlement to use in, in financial contracts and other things, no one's ever going to build that on top of Tether, in my opinion. Um, and so I think like stable coins like USDC will grow and grow and grow. And if you look at the percentage of economic activity or market activity that's going to be denominated in, in stable coins like USDC versus in something that has those other attributes, I think the, you know, the things like a dollar stable coin like USDC will actually represent a much, much, much larger part of the, the ultimate activity. Um, the open question is like, is there, is there an attempt at like intense legal and regulatory enforcement um, on something like Tether? That is an unknown, right? I mean, I mean, we certainly know that, that, that there are there inquiries and stuff, but like, I mean, who knows, right? I, I, I don't want to speculate on that. No, and you know, if it is being used for, let's say, Chinese capital flight, right? 
we don't know who's incentivized. It may be the government who are incentivized to keep it. You know, you, you don't really know the players. So do you see, I mean, there is a, a you know, a theory that goes around of some sort of catastrophic failure risk within this. You concerned by that? Or you just think it just loses its kind of share over time and, yeah. and it's not yeah. big enough in the end to matter? I mean, I think it continues to grow uh, in absolute numbers. And, and, and I think... Um, but I think over the over the mid to long term, in terms of its ultimate market share, I think it will be smaller. Um, and um, you know, I I, I I don't like to speculate on on the books and records issue. <laughs> like I, I I don't know. I mean, I, I really don't know. And um, I, I know there are many significant market actors that really depend on it and and do and 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 do find it trustworthy. And I expect that. And I don't know this, but I would expect that Tether. Is probably transparent about their books and records with some of their big counterparties as well. Um, they may not be with everyone, but um, so I don't know. It's yeah, I'm, I'm I'm actually personally not overly concerned by it, but I want to raise it because it's a big question that goes around. I think sure. I think you know, as as open as they can be, and uh, you know, it's relatively okay. The other one that's contentious but is interesting is XRP. Mm -hmm. How do you think that plays out? Because that's sort of in your space as well, but in a different part of your space. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's sort of two things there. I mean, I've always believed that the 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 kind of payment settlement layer is going to be things like stable coins and that on 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 more generic public chains um and 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 the like. Um and so I, I think that 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 will play out. I mean, in terms of XRP as a security, I, I am not a lawyer here. So like I don't I don't really know. I mean that's going to be a long, a long. Yeah, but but for, forget the legal stuff because none of us know that. It's exactly as you said. You know, do remittances move to stable coins? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, no doubt. No, absolutely. I mean, I, my my very strong view here is that um, you know these sort of uh, you know fiat backed digital currencies um, that that are are you know especially ones that are kind of built around kind of standards and governance and. Can be widely adopted and and the like. That's absolutely going to be the the dominant mode of transaction. Um, another question for you is about the new developments in the Lightning Network. Things like Strike, and I'm not sure you've seen Bottle Pay yet. That's coming out of the UK. Super interesting. Yeah. What are you thinking about Lightning Layer and how that might work for you? Or where yeah, I mean, I mean, I think I think um, we've always we've been tracking this obviously really really closely, and I think. Um, Bitcoin's getting really close, both with Lightning and other extensibility, where you could issue USDC that ran over the Bitcoin infrastructure, right? So at, at the moment that that becomes really viable, we'll be we'll be there. Obviously, um, I think that's you know. Um, are you chain agnostic, essentially? We are totally chain agnostic, and in fact, earlier in 2020, we rolled out essentially a multi-chain governance framework for USDC. And USDC is now issued on Algorand. It's issued on Solana. And very, very soon, it'll be issued on Stellar. And there are going to be many more blockchains. So if there's a public blockchain that has the capabilities to support USDC as a protocol, and it can meet sort of security and, and sort of some of the features that USDC has in terms of how it is administered and operates, then, then USDC should be there. The way I like to think of it is like, your digital dollars should be cross-platform, like just like your digital music. Like if everything it, should be interoperable. I mean, everything should be interoperable. Everything should be cross-platform. To pretend that we know like which public infrastructures are going to be the ones that are adopted. There's a lot of competition there. It's like operating system competition, and and there's gonna be more of that. And so um, you know our commitment is that USDC should be able to be available and interoperable on on many many chains, and we're continuing to roll those out. And you seen interoperability in the beginning from the, your whole career has been that yeah, right exactly it's been exactly looking at that and figuring out how does all this fit together and precisely yeah precisely because a lot of people don't believe in it i mean you know there's the whole maximalist view and stuff like that and it's kind of weird it seems obvious that there's going to be a number of players we don't know who they are or how it's going to evolve right, right. but there's going to be a lot of fun in that process totally yeah <laughs> Jeremy, look, that was fantastic. Really, really interesting. I think people will have learned a lot and got us up to date on all of this. Any other things up on the horizon that we should be thinking about? What about the new SEC chairman? Oh, yeah. Uh, Gary Gensler. I, I like Gary Gensler a lot. 
um, I, I know Gary and he, um, you know, the, the, I actually co-taught uh, an MIT course on blockchain stuff. I was one of the guest lecturers in his course. So what I know about Gary is he's super smart. He's spent a lot of time looking at, at this technology and this space and the issues in it. Uh, I think he cares about them a lot. Um, I think he's also a, a strong regulator. Uh, he, you know, he, he's not, he's, he's not at the whim of anyone. And so I think he's, he's a strong independent chairman. Uh, so I think that's really good, but he's also, I think, probably thinking about the competitiveness of the U S financial sector, uh, the advancements in these technologies, and he's thoughtful about risks. Um, and so I think he's an excellent choice for, for the sec chair. I think, you know, um, there'll be dramatically better engagement, I think, with the SEC, with the crypto industry than under Chairman Clayton. Okay, final question. It's the thing that I've been observing is the wall of money. What are you seeing on your side of the fence? Because I'm starting to ask everybody this, and everybody's kind of wide-eyed with, oh, my God, we're having a lot of conversations with a lot of interesting people. Yeah, What's yeah. your side of the equation? I completely uh, see it, and I, and I see it in two ways. So so one of the, one of the um, offerings we have is what we call our institutional trading program which is basically if you're in an institutional trading firm of some sort, and that could be everything from the family office to like the biggest electronic markets firms in the world, we wanna offer you great dollar market infrastructure for the digital asset world. We have a whole program, we enroll people and launch them on, on our platform and give them access to you know APIs and stuff. That's really growing. I mean, so, so we're seeing just a, a, a lot of new, new firms that are kind of coming in and so, that to me is, is, is a strong indicator. Um, and I think the second is, you know, we have, uh, we have this wait list that we put out for this, you know, high yield digital dollar account product. And we had over 3000 companies sign up. Uh, what's wow. fascinating about it, we haven't launched this thing. Um, and what's fascinating about it is, you know, uh, insurance companies, REITs, uh, banks, uh, brokerage firms, asset managers, registered investment advisors, like just down the list, people who are interested in how to get yield, obviously, but also I think it's a, it's an interesting measure because, you know, <laughs> the way I like to put it is there's bag holders everywhere. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's a lot of people who are really committed to and personally even invested in crypto. And they work in companies all around the world and they work in financial institutions all around the world. And they're all saying, hey, boss, we got to get involved in this. Hey, we ought to be allocating to uh, you know, part of our balance sheet to this. We should be putting Bitcoin on our balance sheet. We should be putting these yield products on our balance sheet. And so we're seeing that's like another kind of institutionalization. And we're seeing that. Uh, we're seeing it. It'll be very interesting to see over 2021. I think that the you know the big news of uh, this insurance company or that pension fund or this asset manager, like that will be there'll be a it will, it will be irrelevant. It'll be uh, it, it'll just be like it, you know ubiquitous. Ubiquitous. Yeah, yeah. We're we're on the way to there. So, okay. The final final question then, because that got me thinking about. Okay, so let's say we bring all of the the insurance companies' balance sheets into this. And the pension funds who need yields, yields are going to converge to right. the interest rate markets, right? We're going to lose the yield pickup over time. I mean, look, I mean, that, that's like the efficient market uh, theory, right? And, and so it's sort of like pick your time frame and, and how dynamic and fast growth are these markets and, and how much uh, essentially ARB exists and, and how's that ARB priced and then how does that flow through, right? So, I mean, that's that's sort of the question. Um, and so when, when people ask, can, are these yields sustainable? Um, well, I, my view is over the long run, no. Um, clearly they'll converge, but how fast and in what form? And then the other thing that becomes interesting in my view is, you know, if the borrowing markets for stable coins, as an example, start to, you know, really as, it, as they become utilities for everyday settlement and transactions, then the kind of borrower profile shifts to more like commercial borrowers. And, and, and so, yes, that would also bring the, the yield curves in line, right? So um, it'll be interesting to watch. <laughs> yeah, just, it's just so fascinating. Brilliant, Jeremy. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Good to spend some time with you. My pleasure. Thank you so much. All right, take care. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, 
Click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.